Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 341 of the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Renner, the show notes are located at continuefit.com or at strengthcoachpodcast.com. All right, today on the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about hip bridges, and we talked about loading, we talked about double versus single leg, surprise, surprise, which one do you think he likes more, and uh, why he does isometric holds at the top. We also spoke about skater squat load progressions and also about teaching the squat movement. Nomly is the member experience platform for modern training gyms, puts all of your communication with your members in one place, allowing you to keep track of that communication. So important for retention. Go to Nomly.com. You can schedule a demo to get a feel for what it's all about. Use the referral code Strength Coach to get started on your free 30 day trial. For the Nomly Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment, I have on Billy Hofacker. And Billy is the CEO of two total body boot camp and performance centers in Long Island, New York. He's also the author of Fitness Profits and the creator of the Financial Freedom for Health and Fitness Professionals course. So kind of off topic from the general perspective of training, but this is for trainers. We're going to talk about how he rose out of his poor financial position, what he means by money being active, why he created a financial journal and what's in it, and the steps in his book, Fitness Profit. So that includes creating a vision, giving first, taking inventory and defining net worth, creating a monthly spending plan, building for an unexpected event fund, and destroying debt and the debt snowball. We also touched on investing a little bit. For the KISS Marketing Business Secrets for Gym Owners with Vince Gabriel, Vince gonna talk about the most valuable asset gym owners own but they treat it like crap. It's probably not just gym owners, it's really trainers in general. And I'll give you a clue, it has something to do with lists and it's not just your email list. Kiss Marketing is a digital marketing agency that helps fitness business owners make the big bucks from the marketing without feeling stupid, stressed, or wasting valuable time figuring it out on your own. If you need some help here, marketing head over to kissmarketing.net to book a free coaching call with will matheson vince gabriel's secret marketing weapon all right for today on the getting started with vbt or velocity based training brought to you by perch perch is a 3d camera based weight room technology solution bringing vbt into the 21st century the cameras effortlessly quantify weight room performance without detracting from it. So this week, Nick is gonna speak about movement quality and force production and velocity-based training. And basically, he's answering the question about, a lot of people have an objection about this VBT because of they think that the form breaks down when athletes are trying to move the bar fast to hit a specific metric. So he's gonna answer to that. All right, guys, right now, the huge summer sale is going on at Perform Better. 40% off a ton of items, including TRX suspension trainers, ultimate sandbags, all kinds of cleaning supplies, Rolga rollers, plyo boxes, and more. Guys, check it all out at performbetter.com. Lots of things to get to you, Sue. Uh, let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. You can try the new strengthcoach.com out for seven days for free. Totally new format, user-friendly, but the same great forum as always. It's the place where the top coaches in the industry come to connect and learn. Seven days for free. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I am doing well, Ann. How are you? All right, all right. Hanging in there. Um, got a lot of stuff going on. Perform Better's coming up in a couple, wow, well, next week. You know, you're going to talk about, well, what's the name? What's the official name of your topic? Uh, I don't remember what I called it to be truthful. Orthopedic costs, but I don't remember. It probably has a, a cooler title than that. Yeah, but. we <laughs> we talked about it last time, uh, yeah. a, a little bit about that. It gets people going. We've got some... Uh, 
So I put a clip on Twitter. Some people got their panties in a bunch. So, uh, but whatever. I did just call it orthopedic cost. Okay. I'm just looking at it right now. So nice. it's really interesting. I'm actually going to probably steal this conversation away from you a little bit, but uh, I got some good info. Cause I listened to the Huberman podcast with Peter Atia. Have you ever listened to Peter Atia? He's a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and it was very interesting because he brought up something that was perfect for my orthopedic cost talk called the J curve. And the basic idea is that, you know, if you look at like the letter J, your your problems, let's just say like the, he was talking about all cause mortality. He was talking about, you know, incidents of death with exercise is a J curve in terms of people who are not exercising. You start exercising. It's like the J. It, it loops down as you exercise and people get healthier, but then it goes back up with people who exercise excessively. Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of like there's a, you know, he talked about it. I, I've i made the reference a lot of times. He talked about the Goldilocks point, you know, of exercise where it's, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just right, like not too much, not too little. And I think that plays right into the orthopedic costing in terms of, you know, people got really mad. Are oh, you telling people not to move? You're telling people not to exercise? And it's like, no, 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 that's not what we're saying. We're just saying that we can make a better choice. I would say, you know, and I use the simple one, squat versus split squat. You know, put a heavy weight on your back or don't. Like, you know, if you can, if body weight will do with no back stress and you're trying to get your legs stronger, why would you not do that? Why would you not consider the orthopedic cost of a particular exercise? So that's, yeah, I mean, and you know, that that's the gist of it. And um, it just was interesting to realize that it kind of, you know, reinforcing it. It's like people who don't exercise aren't very healthy. People who exercise get healthier. Maybe, you know, powerlifters or ultra marathoners or crossfitters are going to have more problems and in some ways more problems than the person who's not exercising when you look at that J-curve idea. So it was pretty cool. I actually put – I've downloaded the J-curve and put it in my presentation. Yeah, I think there's this idea too of uh, people kind of forget like – it's it's just the gym. So you're in there for your, you know, 45 minutes to, you know, depending on if you're an hour and a half, whatever. And for me, like as, you know, being 55 and now working, you know, trying to work more with, with you know, that population, I try to get my people to talk to really understand it's about too about variety. And like, for example, like with this neat idea, non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, what are the things that you're doing outside the gym? But I like yesterday, for example, I rode my bike to work. OK, so I got in, you know, roughly 10 miles of riding my bike to work. But then I came home and I took Emma for swimming. She goes swimming and I'm in the kayak now. Then later on, I did a stand-up paddleboard for like 20 minutes in, at my lake in my house. And that, But the, all those things were not exercise. I did my morning walk with Emma. I don't really consider that exercise because it's really an activity. My heart rate never got above 100 on any of them almost, maybe on the on the morning walk a little bit. But the point is, is like this variety of movement and just kind of keeping movement and to being able to like when you're overusing one thing or the other. So it's like, it's just the gym. You're not telling people also, it's a, like, we're trying to get them better in the gym. Like, what, what do you always, so it's a, the minimum effective dose. And then what are some other things that we're doing outside of it? So I think people, and, and that's the thing too. I think the people that have a, a lot of problems, what I noticed on Twitter when I posted from the last podcast about this idea, people were up in arms. I was like, you didn't even listen to what Mike was saying or what we were having a conversation about, we were asking the question, is there a cost that we really don't even know about it other than orthopedic to the heart, to other organs? I don't know, you know, oh, so. Yeah, that was funny. That really, some people really yeah. came up about that one in terms of, but what I'm finding too, in like you said, is that a lot of people, uh, some people got pissed off about my article about um, acceleration versus max velocity. And it's the same thing I'm, I keep asking. Did you read the article? The guy was bringing up points, and, and I was like, I, that point's in the article. I said that. It, you know, he was talking about 90% oh, isn't fast enough. I said, we established that we wanted to run uh, above 90. I said, so really, we're talking about 91%, not 90. And we were talking about that as the minimum. So 
And it's the same thing with the orthopedic costing, or like we talked about the, the cost, I, you know, with from a cardiovascular standpoint. And we said, hey, this is just a theory. You know, we don't know, but maybe this, you know, super intense exercise isn't good for us. And it's, it always fascinates me how people will immediately generate an argument, yet they will not have listened or read or done whatever it was that I would think would be necessary to be in the argument. Even honestly, it's funny. Even though, like they're like, oh, I question what intense exercise Mike Boyle's done over the last two years. And I was thinking, idiot, wa- oh, just watch his, he's annoying. Mike's annoying with his, his uh, airdyne uh, pose, you know, like he does that stuff. Mike, go- Mike is going hard. He even did all that, like whatever that CrossFit thing was, uh, death by airdyne. I mean, you were, you, that's one thing that you do do from that intense perspective. So it, you, you're not, it's not like you haven't done it in 20 years. Right, exactly. And that's the other thing, as you said, there's just, I don't know, it's, it's unfortunately, it is extremely typical of the internet in terms of people yeah. just, it's sort of, they just, okay, I want to react to this without any context and without ever really looking at it. And I, I have a very opposite view of that in the sense that I want to look at that and think I don't want to end up looking like a fool where someone looks at me and says, oh, have you actually, you know, did you read everything? Did you go through it and realize, uh, you know, oh, no, I didn't actually. And now I look like an idiot because I'm realizing that the point that I was choosing to make is not valid. And that's what a lot of these people, that's, I, I hate to say it, that's why sometimes I continue to argue with people. Because I'm so absolutely certain that they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Coach, Tim Karen posted about weight to hit bridges. So, I, you know, you wrote, you think the two leg is a waste, no surprise. But uh, just a question, when you say weighted hip bridges, what exactly are you talking about? Because when I picture this, I picture the old school bridge, your shoulders are on the ground. Am I right? Or are you talking about like the hip thrust made by famous the, like by the glute by guy? The hip thrust. And I think that's okay. what he, I think he was not referring to it by that name but i believe he was talking about hip thrusts also can you go over how you load it you don't load it with a barbell and why you do a five second iso hold at the top we don't load it with a barbell and we're going to load it with a sandbag or a sand you know a sand tube roll or something like that and i like the five second iso at the top because i think the, the biggest problem with the whole hip thrust idea bilateral or even in some of the hip lift or single leg bridge or whatever that people do is that they just use momentum. It's like, you know, you look at it, it's like pop, you know, pop yourself up, your hips go up, your hips come down. But when you raise yourself up, when you think, okay, like we're going to be specific, I'm going to drive my heel into the ground, I'm going to really squeeze my glute, I'm going to raise my hips up, and I'm going to hold that position for five seconds. That's really different than simply, that's why I hate the name. It's things, there are names that I dislike, hip thrust, sled drag, that they almost denote poor technique where you look and think, okay, this is you know, sled drag. I'm like, sled drag, I mean, you can, you can, like, you just envision, what does a sled drag look like? It looks like somebody just hauling rocks up the hill or something like that, as opposed to thinking backward sled march or forward sled march or TRX, you know, kind of, terminal extension, you know, backward walking kind of thing, sled drag, you're like sled drag, well, whatever, you know, how do it any way you want. And I get that when I see hip thrust to me is exactly the same thing in terms of it is a momentum based exercise that isn't probably going to accomplish what you wanted it to. So, I mean, is that just how you start with people or is there like a progression? Like, can, you know, okay, now we know they got it. Floor. Like we're going to start single leg bridging on the floor. And then we're going to go to single leg, sort of the shoulders elevated, shoulders on the bench, single leg. And then we're going to start, once people can master that, we're going to load that. But I'm going to tell you, most people, if you say five second or even two second hold at the top, most people can't do 10. 10 will be really challenging for the average person in that exercise. And I know for me, 
and again, I'm 62, but a 20 pound sandbag is really challenging for me in, in that particular exercise. And you watch people quote unquote hip thrusting and people have 400 pounds on a bar, but it's not, it's not that kind of deliberate Okay, squeeze your glutes, lift your butt off the ground, you know, exhale, tighten your abs. There's so much, I think there, there's so much complication in that trying to distinguish between hip extension and lumbar extension. So, in any exercise where you're doing that, whether that's Nordics, whether that's slideboard leg curl, whatever it is, you really need to be attentive to that component of it in terms of, okay, what am I doing? Am I simply lumbar extending to make it look like I extended my hips or am I hip extending? And that goes back to the great cook thing in terms of the, the cook hip lift. And they've got that sort of, you know, tennis ball clamped because that's the kind of stuff that, that really changes the exercise drastically. Okay. Yeah. Just so for people to know the cook hip lift is the single leg bridge with the one leg in full flexion, really the hip in, in flexion. You're holding that tennis ball in your hip as you go up. So there's no movement there. Exactly. Um, coach. And then Tim Karen had said, I would say it may not be absolutely necessary to funnel any bridge into more external, external load, isometrics, different tempos, different angles, bilateral slash unilateral can all be programmed. But you had said we found unilateral hamstring with few exceptions, SLDL and hip lift to be tough. I, I'm assuming you were, that's really what you just said. You were like progressing that you're finding it tough on the unilateral hamstring stuff. Yes. And we were thinking like, you, you know, like I'll watch people do um, a single leg, leg slide board leg curl as a, for instance, and generally they're not very well done. So you kind of look at that and think, yeah, yeah, they did it. But again, I just think there's a really high degree of nuance to those exercises that distinguishes between the exercise done well and the exercise done poorly. Okay. Excellent. Um, Coach, let's stay on this kind of, like basic exercise stuff. Wade Alberts posted a uh, Twitter poll. When teaching a squat movement, do you teach A, no, knees over toes, or B, knees behind toes? And I think you had a great answer from a perspective of learning. I would say neither. I don't want a deliberate, conscious knees over toes action, but I don't discourage it. I think this is just allowing for us to like see where they're at. Everybody has different body types. Can you just expand on this idea? Uh, yeah, so when you think about that, and I guess the idea is, I think they were making it two extremes. Do you teach kind of west side box squat, weight on your heels, weight back, sit back, sit back, sit back. Don't let the don't let the shin, you know what um, Charlie would call almost a, a negative shin angle kind of you know thing. Or are we teaching knees over toes, guy? shove your knee as far forward as you possibly can. And, and that was sort of the way the question was worded. And my thing was neither. I'm not telling people to push their knees over their toes, but I'm not telling them their knees can't go over their toes. So I'm going to pretty much let happen naturally what is going to happen. And then I'm going to work from there in terms of teaching. I love it. I think I think all the best coaches that we've seen in this whole art of coaching ideas is, is you know starting to understand like there's not an absolute way a lot like watch first uh, you know and then you know see what where we can make changes or or where you know where what would be optimal for that person. Well, I think and that's where I, I go back kind of to um, to Charlie's stuff and he would talk about you know, he would call it vertical tibia. And I really like vertical tibia if someone is having knee pain. It, to me, it is absolutely the way to do it if the person is having knee pain. And other people will, you know, will kind of push you to, to go the opposite way in terms of knees over toes. But I, I have not ever found that to work. I've never been in a situation where, uh, and I'm going through that right now, you know, with Mark, my son, you know, rehabbing an ACL. If we get, if we keep vertical tibia, he's got very little knee pain. If we get to knees over toe stuff, he's uncomfortable. And I see that all the time in people, whether it's patellotendinitis, whether it's patellofemoral pain, whatever you're dealing with. I've just found, I've found the opposite of what the knees over toes people will tell you. I've found that 
keeping the really now with that person being deliberate about weight back more on the heels and vertical tibia is the way to go. All right. Good stuff. Coach, Gator Squat Load Progressions, this was on the uh, shrinkcoach.com forum, and you had said you like dumbbells first, uh, arms extended, sandbags next, sandbags plus chain, sandbags plus sand roll. Two questions. I I never really like this arms extended idea for any kind of progression. Like, uh, I love the idea for five pounds in each hand from the perspective of a little bit of balance. But do you, uh, can you just remind people, do you increase the load that way? Or are you more focused on, hey, let's let them, let's teach this movement first uh, with the arms extended. Then once we go to sandbags, obviously, we're not going to have dumbbells in our hand. Right. It ends up being way more Zercher style because when you get to the 40 pound sandbag, you will not be extending your arms very much. So it's almost, it goes back, and we keep talking about it, it goes back to sort of the, the great cook idea of self-limiting exercise in terms of you're going to, you will not, or you got to be, you got to be really strong if you're going to press out a 40-pound sandbag as you go down. And most people will not. Most people will just hook it, surger style, and go down that way and be pretty comfortable. Yeah, Coach, uh, I know I've asked you this before, but you talk about heel wedge on the bilateral kind of squatting movements when you're teaching that. Any heel wedges on the single leg stuff? If not, why not? Um, no, we do heel. If, if people need heel wedge, that's, again, I, it's always the first fix for me. So we've got single leg heel wedges. We've got a bunch of ones that are probably six inches long that we got. Uh, we've got a few different ones. We've got some prime ones. We've got some perform better ones. Yeah, but we will use them. We'll use them both with skaters and with one leg squats if we need them. All right. Good stuff, Coach. We will let you go on that. So thanks for doing this, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. And it is always a pleasure. Thank you for all that you do. Hey guys, welcome to Business Secrets for Gym Owners. My name is Vince Gabriel, and today I'm talking to you about the most valuable asset the gym owners own, but they treat it like crap. So hopefully uh, that caught your attention, but uh, the reality is this. What I'm talking about today is your lists, uh, specifically your current customer list, uh, your list of prospects, meaning the people that have reached out to you that haven't converted yet your list of people that used to be clients, um, your list of people that, you know, maybe are on hold, uh, your list of potential partners or joint ventures in your area. We look at what makes our business valuable. And a lot of times people will look at, you know, what gives my business value? Well, you know, your equipment, <laughs> after you buy it, it goes down a lot. And if you've ever sold any used equipment, you know, you don't get a lot for it. You know, some might value their proprietary systems and how they train, but honestly, you can go online and buy that stuff and have someone do that for you very easily. It, it it's really doesn't bring your business a lot of value. What really holds the, the, the monetary value of your business for you itself, not even if you want to sell, but what's the value to you? And, and that is your lists. And I say in the title, they treat it like crap because people don't really look at this as a money making asset. You know, if you, if you really think about, you know, many of you have gyms that have a hundred people, you know, training with you currently right now, and they pay you X amount of dollars um, per month. And you look at that list as, yeah, those are the people that are paying me and I want to do a good job with them. But at the end of the day, in reality, that list is a potential money-making opportunity. Well, how, how would I do that? Well, here's, here's the reality. What, what you would do is, you know, message that list um, of the people that are doing twice a week and ask them if they want to come three times a week. And all of a sudden you have people that, you know, were paying you $300 before and are now paying you $400 before. Well, just the use of that list and the knowledge that that list is value uh, to you will change the the decisions and change the way you run your business. You know, one of the, you know, during COVID-19, one of the things that, you know, was very hard to do is generate a lot of new leads. And 
many, many people got by from not just government funding, but many people got by, my gym included, on using past customer lists and unconverted lead lists and leveraging those things and getting clever and not tricky and tricking people, but getting clever and being consistent and using those those lists. And I think that the, the purpose of today, and I don't have to really, I went in deep uh, when I taught a masterclass uh, this past week on email marketing, but, and I went deep on each list and what you need to do and how you need to leverage it. But today, what I, the, the big takeaway for today in this short, you know, five minute segment that Rana gives me um, is start to look at the lists that you have as value. Start to look at the list as opportunities to make more money and to get more clients and to make more money from the current clients you currently have. If you want your business to be, to be more profitable, you'll start to look at the lists and the things that you own um, w- w- with much more care. You'll, you'll look at the list and you'll make sure the, you know, the lists are updated and you'll make sure that you're actually using the list. And, you know, that you'd be shocked that, you know, when I talk to gym owners, they say, yeah, I got a list of 10,000 people. And I said, yeah, how often do you email? It's like, oh, like once every three months or something like that. That's, that's ludicrous to me. That's crazy that that's leaving so much money on the table. So the big takeaway for today is, Know that you, if you have a business going, you, you most likely have lists, but you got to start prioritizing it. You got to start valuing it. You got to start paying attention to it. You got to start, um, make sure that you're cleaning them up if they need to be cleaned up and, um, and, and know that you have a very, very valuable asset that you may be underutilizing. So hopefully that is helpful. Uh, if you want access to the masterclass that I did on email marketing, where I talked extensively about these, um, these lists and, and how to make more money with email, just go to club.vincegabriel.com. You can sign up for a 60 day trial for a buck and you can get access to that masterclass and all the other ones I've done. So hopefully this was helpful and I will see you next week. Peace. Hey, everyone, welcome to Getting Started with VBT or Velocity-Based Training, brought to you by Perch, a 3D camera-based weight room technology solution bringing VBT into the 21st century. I am Nico Olette, and I'm the head of marketing and education for Perch. And in this series on the Strength Coach podcast, we cover all things related to VBT. So let's dive right in. This week, we are covering movement quality and force production with velocity-based training. Another critique of VBT that we hear often is that form tends to fall apart when athletes are simply trying to move the bar fast to hit a specific number or metric. While that's a valid concern, and certainly there are times of year when the form may be the number one focus, so we won't use VBT, we do always say that nothing will replace a coach's eye when it comes to cohesively coaching and training athletes. So let's keep that in mind. From a biomechanical perspective, the body cannot provide maximal force when joints are not in alignment with their stable and mobile nature, and we've learned this with the joint-by-joint approach. If the knees and ankles are unstable in a squat, it's like trying to shoot a cannon out of a canoe. The body is being asked to perform a stable task in an unstable environment. Ultimately, the quality of movement matters, and this is especially true when maximizing intent in the weight room. And this is why we emphasize that BBT is a great tool to help provide objective guidance around loads. But again, coaches are still needed to coach. For athletes who consistently lose their form when trying to move the bar faster, the two ways we've seen work and what we recommend are pretty simple. The first is to simply turn the screen away from them. If you still want data, but you don't want them to see it, don't let them see it. And the second is to use VBT as a reward or a progression of sorts. If they see their teammates using it or progressing to be able to get to using VBT, they'll be able to work on their form and adjust their behavior to perform the way that they need to be to get to where they want to go and start using that VBT device without losing their form in the process. A last word on VBT and movement quality here, VBT devices can shed light on the differentiation between lower body limbs through objective data points. Perch specifically is able to categorize unilateral movements and assign velocity and power metrics to the right versus left limbs. Therefore, coaches can use these metrics to gain insight into individual leg differences in force development and better understand discrepancies and outputs that could inform injuries before they happen or return to play protocols after they do. That is all for today. Thank you for listening. And if you have any more questions about VBT or want more information and special deals, head to perch.fit slash strength coach. That is perch.fit slash strength coach.
right, now it's time for the Nomly Hit the Gym with a Strength Coach segment brought to you by Nomly, the ultimate retention tool designed specifically for fitness coaches and gyms to help your members stay longer and pay longer. Go to Nomly.com. You can schedule a demo to get a feel for what you can do with this incredible tool. Use the referral code Strength Coach to get started on your free 30-day trial. All right, today we have on Billy Hofecker, and Billy has been a personal trainer for over 20 years, and he's the owner and CEO of Total Body Bootcamp, a performance center with two successful locations in a really competitive market in Long Island. So, and after being, you know, several years, he was a full-time professional martial artist and BJJ black belt. He's now passionate about helping fit pros with their money. He's the author of Fitness Profits, which we're going to talk about mostly today. And he's the creator of the Financial Freedom for Health and Fitness Professionals course. Uh, he's been a host of one of the leading financial podcasts for fit pros, Your Fitness Money Coach Podcast. So Billy, thanks for coming on, bro. Anthony, I'm excited to chat with you. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for the uh, the awesome intro. By the way, did I just butcher your last name? Because I didn't even, th- I always think of that and always ask people, how do you pronounce I, your last name? I think it was like on a scale of one to 10, it was maybe like a two. No, I'm just kidding. It, was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't bad. Um, it's Hofacker. I, you know what? See, that's the New York thing. I was going to say Hofacker and I'm like, no, don't be a New Yorker <laughs> and say ho. Damn. All right. See, I should have just stuck with my instincts. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, like I said, I went through your book. I know Coach Boyle has recommended your book. Pat Rigsby uh, has a uh, a recommendation right on the cover. Uh, and this is such an important thing. And I think it's, look, we have so many people leaving this industry. And part of it is they think, you know, like, yeah, we don't make as much money a lot of times, but there is a lot of potential. But what I think happens to a lot of people is they just don't understand a lot of this stuff. And then they get caught up. And then it's like, whoa, I don't even know how to get out of this. And then they give up. And your message in the book is, no, don't give up. Here, Here's some steps you can take. But I, I want to start out with, you know, <laughs> the, the book starts out with like, you know, you get a knock on the door, your car is getting repossessed. You're several months behind on your mortgage. Your, your wife is like six months pregnant. I just want to know how the hell you got to that point and what was the real culprit? Because like, I know for me, sometimes I'll, I, I've done that in the past. And, and even if it was well-intentioned, like I had a coach down in Nashville, Michael Hyatt, actually, you know, and it was expensive and I had to go to Nashville every quarter and that's hotels and planes. And, you know, and I kept thinking, no, 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 it'll be okay. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be making money. I'm going to be making money. And, or, or was it overspending or was it unawareness? Just how did you get there? Man, I, I, so it's such an interesting question. A part of me feels like I have no clue. Uh, I feel like I'm at such a different point in my life right now. So this is going back about 11 years, I believe. And I'm, I'm, such, a, I'm such a different place right now. And it's hard to believe that I got into that position. I, I don't know if uh, listeners can relate. I, I used to get, unfortunately, I'm being honest, I used to be judgmental. I see somebody who was like super overweight and I'd be like, how could they get to that point? Like, didn't they realize like at some point that they're going the wrong way. Uh, and then here I am uh, doing the same exact thing with my finances. Uh, I, so if I had to answer that question in a, in a nutshell, I would say death by a thousand cuts is the, is the, is the perfect way to explain it. But other things that you said really jumped out at me. You talked about overspending. I, I feel like there's two extremes. I, on one level, I'm not a big spender and I've never been a big spender. Even when I was younger, when my friends were going out, spending a whole bunch of money. I felt, I feel like I was always careful. I I don't care about material things. I never wanted like a super fancy car or anything like that. Uh, At the same time, uh, there were things I was overspending on. Those were things that were important to me. Now, when I teach fit pros to manage their finances, it's not about just sacrificing everything and not buying anything you want, but it's just doing it with a plan 
doing it according to your values. I'll give you an example. I was when we finally. I know we're going to talk about some of the steps, uh, but you know, one of those was you know <laughs> taking inventory and just kind of having an understanding of where we are. Fit pros, uh, we do FMS, we do different assessments for our clients. We got to know where they're starting. Uh, so when I did that, I, I, I got to the realization that I was uh, I was doing private BJJ lessons. It's a big passion of mine. Keep in mind, I'm drowning in debt. You know, no, no idea what I'm doing. But I was spending 140 bucks a pop twice a week for jiu-jitsu lessons, which, it, looking back, was so foolish. Uh, but it was like it was like your point about your your uh, your mastermind, your coaching, where I, I was I was a professional martial artist, uh, so I was like, this is going to come back to me because I'm going to be a better instructor. I'm going to be able to charge more. And I think oftentimes we don't we minimize uh, the, the 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 we 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 we're all playing on the upside. Like it's all about the upside. This is what's going to happen. But then we uh, we take some risks, uh, and, and we need to evaluate those a little bit better. And and like you said, I think. And you think, okay, about the future, I like that. You know, you're looking at the upside. And you want to be positive, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, going into it, uh, you know, you got to make sure you do have that kind of plan or where it's coming from. So l let's talk about a little bit about some of the, the things that people might that, – that were kind of new to me actually as well. And, and one of those things is you were talking about money being active. What do you mean by that? So uh, when I say money is active, I think people just make, uh, oftentimes, myself included, uh, they, we just make these willy-nilly decisions and we don't realize the effect it has on every area of our lives. Like some people, we, I talk a lot about mindset uh, and some of us grew up with beliefs and these beliefs come from either experiences we had, things that we were taught and those things that we were taught, they could have been verbal things. Uh, like a common one is you know, money doesn't grow on trees or you know we, we don't have enough, we don't have, we're not we're, we're we're not the Rockefellers is a big one uh, in New York. Uh, we we just uh, money is the root of all evil is a common one in religious circles. And so people grow up with these sort of mindsets, uh, and they maybe think money is bad, uh, and and it's not. Uh, money it could be really good. You can do really great things with money. You could take care of yourself. You could take care of your family. You can be generous. Uh, you can enjoy yourself. You can also do really bad things with money, and we know that happens all the time. Uh, but the point is, is that it has energy, and when we make the, the quote-unquote right decisions, and we're making uh, those uh, plans according to our values, we are making a plan, we're sticking to the plan, we're setting those goals. Another thing I talk a lot about is goal setting. And when we do that, uh, it's active and we can get that momentum that that money brings. And I just want to encourage the listeners because you know, even in your opening, you mentioned about how a lot of times they don't, they may not make as much money, which is 100% true. With that said, I don't know where everybody's at. Maybe people are, you know, $130,000 in non-mortgage debt like I was, car repossessed, home uh, at risk for being uh, for, foreclosed on, uh, all these, these, these stressful things. Or maybe they're doing a little better or maybe a lot better. Uh, but I just like to encourage people, and uh, I'm, I'll just speak firsthand, and also people that I've worked with, people that I know, you can do it. And it starts with that attitude. It starts with that mindset. I just think of one guy I know named Max. Uh, he is a fit pro. He's never done anything else. He's only trained people, just like a lot of people listening. And he has about a million dollars in his retirement accounts. And yes, he did that from training. Did he ever make $500,000 in one year? No, he didn't. He did not make an insane level of income, but he was able to do it. And uh, so that's what I mean when I say money's active. You, you, you can, you know, you can use it for good. You can use it for bad. You can uh, gain that momentum that comes with making those wise decisions, or, or the opposite, like I did. Uh, and I let it, I let it just about uh, almost ruin my life. Really, really mess things up in a big way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know you can get down that hole, and a lot of people have, and they feel like there's no way out. So let's another thing that you were doing was you created a financial journal. And uh, nowadays, people talk so much about journaling that, um, like, I just wanted you to clarify, like, what was this financial journey? Like, because obviously we have software to take, you know, to kind of keep track of things. Were you writing your thoughts in there? Were you writing what your expenses were? Like, what, did, what, what was this journal and why was it important for you? 
And that's awesome, Anthony. I appreciate that question. I don't know if anybody's asked me that before, so I really like that question. I am a big a believer in in journaling. And just to answer your question, what my journal looked like, it was more like the first example that you gave. This particular journal, it, it wasn't so much me talking about my you know, my net worth and uh, and the, you know the budget and that kind of stuff. We did do all that, and that's part of the deal, part of the process. Uh, but this particular uh, journal was really just journaling the process. I, I think a lot of us, you know, you, you, I'm sure the listeners have heard, and Anthony, I know you have heard of the, the fixed versus the growth mindset. A lot of us are stuck in a fixed mindset. We might we might be really great when it comes to fitness, and hey, we can crush our goals. We can we can increase our weight. We can decrease our body fat, and, and we're and we're good with that. But when it comes to finances, maybe we weren't taught, and we just have more of a fixed mindset. Uh, and without journaling, I feel like it's really difficult to improve uh, because. Just like anything, if you don't know there's a problem or you don't know what the problem is, and oftentimes the problem is not external. We think it is. Uh, and I actually just I just shared that somewhere else. It was like, we think we need like a budgeting tool. We think we need uh, a, a new book. Uh, we think we need these external things, our clients. They think they just need a new kettlebell or they think they just need a diet plan. And yeah, those things are great in, in cases. They have their place, but there's another side to it. And that other side is what's going on inside of us. So if I'm wrapped with fear and uncertainty and I'm discouraged or, or maybe worse, I need an outlet for those things. Uh, so that was one purpose of the journal was to was to really just kind of have an understanding of where I was, what was going on. It was also really cool just to document the progress. So we celebrated wins in that journal. That These are the things that we've learned to do. These are some of the milestones that we've hit. Of course, paying down all that debt. There's lots of milestones along the way. You, you asked me how I got into the debt. We didn't yet talk about how I got out of it. And it's very similar, right? It didn't happen in one shot. So I think just celebrating those wins along the way, recognizing how far you've come. So really just those three questions uh, that I often share, which is, you know, where was I? Hey, where was I? I was in a terrible position. I was in a lot of debt. I was suffocating. I was scared. My marriage, I don't want to like over dramatize it. And my marriage was falling apart. I mean, at some level, there is some truth to that. We, we couldn't talk about money without arguing. It's a common thing, Anthony, that people uh, struggle with is communicating with their partner. Uh, so that's something, something, you know, a whole nother thing that I learned, but that was part of that. You know, we were doing this together. We we're journaling and it's uh, it's it's where am I now, right? So what progress have I made so far, which I just touched on, and it's where do I want to go, which is that just really fires me up. Where do I want to go? Because it doesn't matter what ha it matters, but it doesn't, right? Where I was, where I am now. What matters is who you're becoming, and that's a powerful thing. And if you use the power of the journal, you can you can share where do you want to go. You can list out your goals, vision. I know we're, we're gonna uh, talk a little bit more about that, uh, but. Uh, we did, you know, we just kept ourselves motivated with it. There were quotes and scriptures and just tidbits of things that we heard that we found helpful, uh, just documenting the, the the progress. And I guess now that I think about it, there was a little bit of the like the steps that we were doing, you know, like, hey, this week we did this uh, next week. We want to do this. So I guess it was a combination of the thoughts, the the, the motivation, the bigger goals, but then also the, the steps that we that we were taking as we were going through. Yeah, that's. I like it. And I love what you said about this idea of how far you've come as well, because I think, have you heard of the gap in the game from Dan Sullivan? I have not like super familiar with it, but I have heard about it. Okay. So it's just this uh, really simply, it's saying, okay, if you have a goal of, you know, getting 10 clients uh, uh, this month and you get seven, we always focus on the three that we didn't get. And what he's saying is, although you should still work to get, you know, to, to get your goals and, but you should also kind of pat yourself on the back and understand like getting seven was pretty good. Now, if you got two, that'd be a different story, but you got yeah. seven, you know, or you got eight. That's like a pretty good number. We never really pat, like, like you said, pat ourselves on the back a little bit to say like, Hey, you're doing a good job. Like, and we're going to talk about like this idea about this, um, you know, with the with the debt snowball idea. To me, it's very similar. It's like starting to make these little wins, the little ones, building momentum, building confidence. But let's get into kind of the plan here in terms of how the book went. And number one was creating a vision. And although 
I absolutely love that. I think it's so important. I think for you, you had a, a different vi- version of the vision in terms of yours was a little bit shorter. I want you to talk about how detailed do you get with the vision, how far out, and what does it include? Yeah, it's interesting because that that, that has evolved even over the years. Uh, so the, the the thoughts behind the the vision is it's when you're stuck or when you're feeling stuck in your current circumstances, you need something to, to give you hope. And a big, big part of that is the future and where we're going. Uh, and once we start losing hope, that's a really scary place to be. Uh, so creating that vision, I recommend as a first step for, for anybody. Uh, and, and that could look different for different people. Uh, of course, I'll share some principles that I recommend. Uh, but we're all wired different. And what works for one might not work exactly the same for, for another. But I like... I like all the time frames and you could do it theoretically, you could do a one year, you could do two year. They're all good. Uh, but I like three years. I, I feel like three years is a really uh, good amount of time to think about when you're doing a vision uh, because three years out, it's not so far in the future that you, you know, 10 years, like, man, I, I just read recently, it was Keith Cunningham. He said, think about where you were 10 years ago. And I, 99.9% of people would like, would have never in a million years been able to guess where they are now 10 years ago or, you know, picture when you were 18 years old, you know, where you would be now. Uh, so I think that's true. And I, so I think a shorter time frame, like three years, is also long enough to, uh, to make some big progress. Uh, so I like that, that, that time period. And uh, essentially, you, know, you have a goal, which is more spe- specific, uh, and the vision is a little, a little cloudier in a way uh, because it's like a bigger picture and it's just that dream that you have for yourself. What do you want your life to look like? Uh, keep in mind that your, your finances, what, what is the purpose? It's not just for the money. It's not just getting into a better financial position, it's, but it's about what that does for you. And that's what excites people. I know a lot of couples – where you know one of them, they they're maybe excited about the numbers because they're a little bit nerdy about it, and that, that that's that's how I am. You know, I just I just like this stuff, right? But other, not everyone's like that, so they don't care. You don't care about a higher net worth or or even making more income. But it's what does that do for me? That's what I want to know. Okay, what do we want this to look like? Uh, we want to do you know do these types of things with our family. This is what I want to be doing with my day because when I get into a, a better position, a, a word I use a lot is margin, and it's just a powerful word uh, because when you have that margin, you have more freedom, and when you have that freedom, you can make a different decision. Maybe you don't want to be on the training floor. 12 hours a day. Maybe you do, and that's great, but maybe three years from now or longer, you're going to want to be in a different role. So those are the kinds of things that you can look at with a vision. Of course, material possessions. What do you want it to be driving? What do you want your house to, to be like? What kind of experiences do you want to have? Do you, what kind of uh, vacations do you want to take? You know, Just looking at all these areas, and I, and I recommend going beyond the financial and just looking at all the areas because it's all that they're all interrelated and they all kind of fuel each other. When you have the finances in order, you can improve your relationships and vice versa. So you're looking at all those areas, everything from you know from your fitness to your finances to your to your faith to your your, your uh, the fun that you're having. You know those F words are, are powerful. Uh, so uh, it's looking at that, it's creating that, and uh, we did a vision board. I know you know there's different uh, kind of uh, approaches to that, uh, but we had fun with it. We uh, we just you know got some magazines uh, back. I don't think you need to do that anymore, but this was this was a little while back, and we just you know just tried to keep ourselves motivated. Another thing we did, which was awesome. I don't. I guess this is in the vision. Uh, it's in the it's in the vision slash motivation slash mindset category is with any of our big goals we created visuals for that we were able to to keep in front of us. So super sexy, right? I'm married to my, you know, my beautiful wife. We're just starting out. And uh, one day she uh, closes the bedroom door and sees like this big chart on the door uh, with our, our financial goals and like a bar that we're kind of filling in as we're, as we're reaching these goals. <laughs> uh, but honestly, that was really, really helpful for us. Uh, I, 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 sound, I sound like maybe nerd or, or weird, but like I, I, it's so exciting to, to fill that bar up as we're paying down our debt you know, and uh, it kept us motivated. Uh, no, I, you, you mentioned it with the car. And I always tell people that as well. When you start to put this out there, put it in front of you, you start to see things that are also going to help you. So with the car, like what I was saying, I forget what kind of car it was that you that you first got the used car. But you never even 
you did all this research. You didn't even know what this car was. But then you said, oh, this is the kind of car. Now, all of a sudden, you start seeing that car. It always happens like that because it's now it's in your vision. And so now we start to make moves towards that. So I, I agree 100 percent. I, I think it's uh, it's a, I actually did a, do a vision board, but. I actually did it on Canva because instead of buying magazines, I just <laughs> kind of get pictures and I put them on. And then on Canva, I did it. And then you could just get it printed. So I had nice. Canva print it and they sent it to me and I put it. I actually have my own journal in a in a uh, uh, like a binder. So I just put it in the binder. And that's nice. actually the page, the page uh, like marker. So I just know where I, I, you know, and I just look at that and. It's all there, so it's kind of interesting. But um, no, that's interesting because we we did a we did a vision uh, this uh, with January, so we're on we're on like our you know our, our new one now, and we learned from the whole magazine thing, so we just like printed pictures. Uh, so, uh, but I like your idea, so we might have to try that next. So we're gonna do one again. So now it'll be two years from now, right? Because we're about a year into the this one. Uh, but yeah, I think the point is you 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 can do it however works for you. But the the point is is not to overthink it and 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 just to just to get something out there because yeah, you, uh, whatever you focus on, you're going to get more of, you're going to see more of it. I see, I've seen that in so many different areas. Absolutely. And speaking of which the next step is to give first. And I really like this because <clears throat> it wasn't just about money at first. People are going to read this and say, Oh, come on, guy, I'm trying to pay off my debt. You want me to give money to a charity, whatever. But you're not saying about giving all of your money away. Also, it's not just money. Go over, give first. Yeah, absolutely. This was huge. And I think the biggest takeaway here, and this is what I really want people to, to grasp. And I'm not, trust me, I'm not trying to speak down to anybody or be like, like overly teaching. But the character that we develop, I believe, is more important than than almost everything else. And I realized that there were some, there were some, problems with my character and I was uh, you know a little bit more about what I wanted and once I started shifting that focus and I you know I don't want to say that hey once you start once you start being generous you're going to become a millionaire but I will, I'll say from my experience the, the 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 sooner I started giving the more I started giving money and otherwise I have seen much more come to me and uh, one of the analogies I heard for that was like when when you're when you're not willing to be a giver and that could, again it could be financially or otherwise you have you have your fists are clenched right and so you have everything you, you, it's all yours right you're like a miser uh, but the problem with that is because your fists are clenched nothing can get into them and you can't receive but and this is what i have seen play out in a major way when you open those hands and you decide to be more giving your hands are open for you to receive. And I don't want that to be misconstrued. You don't do it because you want more, but it's just a, it's just a byproduct of it. My wife and I are going through a, a you know, decision of doing some a, a significant giving now. Uh, and it's, it's exciting. It's one of the most exciting things you can do with, with your money or just with your time or with your words. I mean, those are, those are two good examples of non-financial ways to give. It's we, we, we are all so in need of encouragement uh, there's a uh, Ken Blanchard said that most people haven't received a round of applause since they walked on the stage to graduate high school and mm. you know, go decades and decades without receiving any praise or kind words. And it, they are so powerful. I can just point to, to, I don't think I wrote it in this book, but I can point to times where literally like a sentence that somebody said completely changed my life. Those words have impact. And we all think of that coach or that teacher or that parent or whoever it was that said something they believed in us when we didn't believe in ourselves and that's free anybody can do that i heard i, I heard this quote once it was it was something that stuck with me it said a, a nice thought about somebody is just a thought it's not a compliment it's not you're not doing anything until you actually tell them to actually say it uh, so a lot of us we think oh that person they, you know they're doing really well and it's like you don't tell them uh so i i encourage you to to be generous with your words and then time, maybe you don't have as much money to give as you'd like. Uh, you, can don you can donate your time. You can donate your abilities or your skills to maybe those that, uh, that are in need. And I'll just challenge people, even financially, we're all going to think at some level that we don't have enough. But when is enough enough? Uh, so we did, in our case, I'm not trying to sound holier than thou, but we did start giving financially even when things were tight. You know, Again, just start with something. 
because uh, you think about where you're spending is when you when you when you get to some of these later steps and you start tracking. It's like, you know, the whole like latte factor or whatever it is, you know, you have, you have, you have more than you think to, to be able to do good things with. Yeah. That's a great segue into number three, taking inventory, because until you really look at your accounts and some of the, it's funny, some of the, even your bank, your bank, a lot of times will kind of have some charts that'll tell you, like kind of put them in uh, different categories. So you can kind of see, but uh, just to look and to write things down and to start saying, Wow, I'm I'm spending. We're spending a little too much money. I didn't realize how much money we're spending on going out, or you know, going out to dinner, or whatever it may be. And you take a few of those away, and you have a little bit more awareness. So, give us this idea about taking in inventory. What does this involve? And please explain net worth to people. Oh, cool, man. I'm glad you asked that. It's, it's I always compare this to the the you know to taking taking inventory with with fitness. Uh, most uh, most good coaches or trainers they're going to do some level of assessment, even if it's just taking them through a workout to see where they are. They're going to see what their strength is. They're going to they're going to see what their mobility is, and they're going to at some level they're gonna, that's going to guide their program. If you don't know where you're starting, it's really hard. You have to know where you're starting. You have to know where you are, and you have to know where you're going. Uh, so that, that's what taking the inventory was, and, and you hit it right on the head when you you said you, you have this these. Oftentimes, you have these categories that you're spending on, and you don't realize, but they could make a tremendous difference. I mean, I mentioned I'm 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 telling you, I'm in over six figures of debt, and here I am. What's what is it? One forty, and I was doing two like eight a month. I mean, think about that. Like, yeah. I didn't even—I didn't even realize I'm spending like a lot of money on something that I really can't afford. Uh, so, I mean, maybe you're not as dumb as I was, and you're not making you know those kinds of decisions. But you never know. You know, you never know what what you can what you can accomplish and what will add up over time if you could take a look at that. Uh, so, a lot of people they don't. There's there's different reasons why they don't know where they're at financially. Maybe they were never taught. Maybe they have those mindset issues, which I alluded to. Maybe they just don't have the, the, the technical ability. They don't know how to, you'd be surprised. Like people, they don't even know how to log into their accounts. Maybe they have issues with a spouse and somebody's controlling. I mean, there's all types of things that, that people can deal with. Uh, but it's important to, to be able to take inventory, to know where you're at. And that, yeah, that includes where, where, where's it going currently? What's coming in, right? So what's coming in, what's going out, where it's going, and just doing a, doing your diligence and just tracking that for a period, and you'd be amazed just what that does. This is a, an interesting point, I think. When I got to this point and we started really getting serious with this, I was spending more. There was what is it? There was more month than money. I was spending. I, I was making less than I was spending. Then, this is a side note. I believe I mentioned this in the book. I, I, I lowered our household income for uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, my wife's job, uh, uh, she became a stay-at-home mom, and I opened my own business. I, 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 at that point, a lot of that uh, debt or all of that debt wasn't from, from a business. It was just personal decisions. So I took a huge leap of faith, and we ended up with a lower income, and now we're able to pay for everything that we're planning. So that's just to illustrate that people think, and it's not that it's not that there's no uh, validity. There's a lot of validity. You know, you want to increase your income. You want to negotiate raises and increase your business, and all those things are important. But it's a myth that you, it's, you have to just. It's all about making more money, and and the reason why you're in trouble is because you're not making enough. Because I was a prime example of that. I was making less money and doing better once I started getting on a plan. Uh, so that was huge. Uh, and the net worth is awesome because it's it's net worth is not to be confused with self worth. It's just a current snapshot of where you are. And if you're like me, uh, when I started, and I did my net worth. I was negative. Uh, so uh, from a financial standpoint, I was worth less than zero. Um, again, nothing to do with my true identity and my and my my true worth. Uh, but it's just a starting point. It's it's an awesome way to gauge your financial position. You can set goals to improve your net worth. You can make a strategy and uh, you, know, you can build in some accountability so that you, you can improve your net worth. Uh, so let's talk about what it is because there's a lot of misconceptions about it. So I'm going to keep it really simple. In one sentence, it's what you own minus what you owe. So the things that you own are considered assets. 
Uh, and there's really no other way to to uh, explain a net worth. And people will, will talk about liquid net worth and they'll, they'll come up with all these different scenarios. But a, but a true net worth is simply what you own, which are your assets. That would be examples of that would be cash, money that's in, in retirement accounts. It could be real estate. It could be uh, equity in real estate. Uh, and, and, and liabilities are the things that you owe. So that that could be you know any money that you owe vendors, money that you uh, owe for college, money. In my case, I had I owed everybody. It seemed like you know hospitals. I owed uh, family members from loans. I had a friend uh, do a, a job at my house, and I, I took out debt with him. I mean, I had debt all over the place. Those were all liabilities. That was money that I owed. So when you take that top number, the assets, you subtract that bottom number, the liabilities, you end up with a number, positive or negative, and that would be considered your net worth. So I encourage people to do that exercise, and it's scary for some people because they don't want to. They don't want to see that. But like I said earlier. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll say it in a better way now because I just heard this quote. It's like when you shine the light on the darkness, it starts to fade. And it's not until you can walk through that reality. When I when I did this, as bad as my situation was, I, I felt like a breath of fresh air. I felt so I felt so excited because I was like, you know what? Let's do this. I know where I'm at and I'm going forward. Like it was really like game on. I really felt that way. Whereas before that, when I didn't know what was flying – I, I didn't feel that way. I just felt totally discouraged and like I would always be like this. I'd be an old man with like no money and I wouldn't know what to do with re retirement. Like I had no idea what, how things were going to play out. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're doing that, do you look at like from a monthly perspective or a yearly perspective, do you say, well, I owe homeowners uh, association $300 a month. I owe Con Ed, my electric, $100, water, $50. Do you, you include any of that? That's a good question. I would not. Okay. I would only include like outstanding debt, debt that is past due and that kind of thing. Okay, cool. So once we do this, we can now, now is the good part. Now is kind of starting to make the real change and that is create a spending plan. And I, I love the way you put this, you know, we pay for things automatically, no problem. I get on Spotify, I get on, you know, uh, Netflix, whatever, but we're so reluctant to save for things automatically. Talk to us about creating a spending plan. Yeah, I love it. There's a few different pieces here. I'll, try, I'll start with a simple explanation because I don't want to overcomplicate it because it doesn't have to be or, uh, overly complicated. But from a simple standpoint, it's taking every dollar that comes to your hands and deciding in advance where it goes. So you can do this with, with anything, right? You can do this with your time, right? Hey, it's Saturday morning and I got four hours. What am I going to do with that time? You can sit on the couch and watch Netflix, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with. But generally, it's not going to lead you closer to uh, your ideal life, especially if you didn't plan on doing that. Or you could say at 8 o'clock, I'm going to hit the gym. At 9 o'clock, I'm going to have breakfast with my, uh, my partner. At uh, 10 o'clock, I'm going to do some housework. You're planning what you're doing with your time. So you're doing the same thing with your money. You say, I have X amount coming in. And I realize that different uh, trainers and uh, strength coaches and fitness professionals, they have different – sources of income. You know, some are business owners, some are independent contractors, uh, some are employees. It doesn't really matter. There will be different methods of getting paid. You know, some people are paid uh, bonuses and commissions. Some are paid, paid a flat salary. Some income is irregular with, cer with certain businesses. Oh, so however that comes in, you want to plan for that. This is how much I plan. So we're recording this now late August. I don't know when it will be aired, but if we're looking at September, it's like, hey, let's look at what's coming in in uh, in uh, September, and that might be uh, every Friday we get paid, or maybe you know you're married, and so all the household income. That's a whole other side is like combining income with a with a partner or a spouse, and uh, but anyway, so you have the money coming in, then you're deciding in advance where it goes. Okay, so this is how much our housing is. That would be our utilities, our our rent or our mortgage. This is our food. That's a big one, especially now with inflation. It's it's going up and up. Uh, so we need to plan for that. This is how much we're going to spend on food. We're going to allocate that amount before the month starts. And this is the plan. And you do that for all the categories. You might have clothing. You might have self-care and haircuts and all, all that, all those kinds of things. Wherever that money is going, you want to plan it out. In an ideal scenario, this, is, this, this can get a little confusing for people, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure it's clear. You want to make sure that, that you're planning where all of your money is going. That does not mean that all of your money has to like go away. 
part of your plan can and ideally should include money that's going towards fun things, money that's going towards future things, and that's what you alluded to, Anthony, which is saving, money that's going towards wealth building, money that may be going towards paying down debt. These are all things that are going to improve your net worth, just to jump to that previous point. So that's the like the simple explanation. It's, it's making a plan for where your money is going to go. Uh, and then, of course, you want to make sure it goes there. Uh, it's like, if a client comes to you and you give them a workout and you know they can just take that and 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 crush it or they can maybe uh, just neglect to do it right so you want to make sure you're tracking and you're and you're actually living in that making decisions based on that plan so anthony just to just to just to make sure that we're not getting too into the weeds i i can talk a little bit more about like like different types of purchases and and saving for them would that be helpful yeah that would be great i mean because also i think with this idea about creating the spending plan. I think people, first of all, have to understand the reason why you said take inventory first is because it'll give you an awareness of where you're spending these things to say, okay, I've been spending $500 a month on food uh, at the grocery store and 700, you know, another 500 on going out to dinner. So you can start to say like, well, we're going to keep spending, you know, add an extra hundred. It's important to understand that inventory before this spending plan. But that, so that's where you're getting the numbers, but there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just piggyback on that and just say those those two the two biggest categories that you want to watch out for are housing and food. I, I know housing is not such an easy thing, but that's those are the areas that most people spend. You know, they'll come to me and their mortgage is like fifty percent of what they make, and it's going to be really hard to get ahead financially if that's the long term position. Uh, and then food, a uh, big uh, quote unquote budget buster, is just eating out. You know, people that just they're not planning their meals and they're eating out every day, and it just it just adds up to a tremendous amount, and they don't realize it because it's just you know, 10, 20, 30 bucks a day, uh, but it really adds up in addition to what they're spending on uh, at the grocery store. Uh, so I just want to point out different types of, of expenses. Uh, so of course you have those that are happening every month. You know, example would be like your rent or your mortgage. It's on the 15th every month and it's X amount of dollars. It's not really changing, uh, at least very frequently. Uh, those are pretty easy to account for. So you, you put those on your spending plan and they, they might come out of your main checking account, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, the ones that I can get people is what I just mentioned. Those are like the daily spending, the, the free, their daily or frequent spending. These are the things you're just buying throughout your your days and your weeks. They're, they're, they're pretty frequent. And if you're not planning for them, you can really uh, go overboard. Uh, so I recommend paying for those things uh, either with a separate debit account. So you would have like a food debit card, for example. So you're kind of building in a boundary for yourself. So if you want to spend $500 per food, you would just use that same account for that food so that you know that you know exactly how much you have and you know when you know when you might go over and you can really keep that in check. Uh, the other idea is to pay cash, which I like. Uh, if you're able to do that, you're going to the store, uh, paying cash, at least for a short period of time, that will allow you to really get a feel for what you're spending. I challenge somebody who's listening to do that, and I promise you, you'll learn about yourself. When you pay cash for things, you give somebody something and you don't get it back. Sounds overly simple, but there's power in that. When you give somebody a credit or debit card, they hand it right back to you. Uh, so there's an emotional, psychological component that is not felt when you're using plastic. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We use debit cards all the time. I'm just saying that there is a difference when you when you use cash. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, but the last one I want to get to here, of course, we can't cover everything here, would be the saving. Uh, so I'm a big believer in planning ahead and looking out. And 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 you mentioned doing different events. That's a good example of that for for the fit pros. And you, know, you might be wanting to go to a perform better or or other event, or, or maybe you want to go on vacation by with your family, and you want to make sure that you're not. Uh, paying for those things for years uh, with interest. You want to make sure you're planning for those things. Uh, so what I recommend on that is to set up some what I call random accounts. So you're going to set up uh, an account and you could call it continuing education. In fact, I have one called that, right? And what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about, okay, how much am I planning on spending on an annual basis? Now for simple, simple numbers, I don't feel like doing math. Let's call it $2,400. Uh, so you're going to spend $2,400 on your continuing education in the next 12 months. So all you're going to do is you're going to make $200 part of your monthly spending plan. 
and you're going to transfer that $200 as if you were using it, but you're just saving it and you're putting that into a, I recommend a separate online account. There's easy, free accounts you can use. Uh, I use Capital One, but you could also use Ally. I, of course, if you're in the US, uh, other countries, uh, I'm sure they have options. Uh, or if not, you could apply the principles either way. How, How many do you have? have? How many accounts? Oh my do you goodness! Have? Oh my goodness! This is this is interesting because I have a lot, and it sound it might sound to somebody who's who's listening like overwhelming, but it is not. I'll tell you why because it's all automated. So I have everything set up to pull from Capital One, uh, from Capital One to I'm uh, sorry, from to my main account to Capital One, from my main account to Capital One for all of those things. So we have one for a vacation, we have one for a future car, we have one for uh, continuing education, we homeschool our children, so we have one for homeschool supplies, books and supplies, we have one for house improvements, anything that you could think of that I have one for my kids, I have four kids and you know they're gonna need braces and stuff like that, so we have one for that. So. Anything that is going to require a significant amount of money at a later date, it could be an option to do that, to do an account like that. Uh, but here's the last point, because um, I know it could, it could sound like a lot. The reason why I have this is I've been doing this for a while. I didn't start with having all these accounts. So start with just one. What's the one? Like another one I have is a, is a holiday account. So for Christmas time, you know, we're going we're gonna to buy all these gifts, but we didn't plan for it. Uh, now we can save throughout the year for that. So that would be a good one to start with. But really, whatever one jumps out at you that you think would make a good difference, I would start with. Okay, good. Yeah, I think one game changer for me, and this is kind of part for my business, was when I was really having struggling with this idea of estimated taxes mm. because I was taking a salary. And but then you know I, I live in Indiana now, so you're you know you're not supposed to take a salary. You're supposed to take just take the money out whatever. Sure. And then, but understanding and having the, that like separate tax account was huge because now yeah. I, every time I pay myself, I just take 30%. I put it into the tax account. I also take an extra couple hundred dollars to pay the real estate taxes. I know it's coming up and I know what that number is, right? That in November, I have to pay real estate taxes in India, November and May, I think. And so I just kind of say, okay, I have five months. It's going to be Thirteen hundred dollars, whatever. I have to spend X amount, so I do it that way. You know, so I you know, both. That's two in one, but still, mm -hmm. it's yeah. uh, it's been a tr a big game changer. So I just wasn't sure how many you had. Yeah, absolutely, you you can combine them, and I do that too. So this is this is going to sound even crazier. So I know we're we're talking personal finance, but I ha I have eleven business accounts, and so I have the same kinds of things for for the business, and some of them are combined because they're like you know I, it's just easy for me to keep track. And what I do is when I nickname them, I I I type in what it's called. So let's say uh, continuing education or holiday, and I'll put in the nickname of the account the amount that I'm transferring every month, just so that everything is really clear. Oh, nice. I like that. Um, well, speaking of another account, really important, build an unexpected event fund. And I really want you to talk about, you know, how do we start this in terms of, I know we're going to look at our inventory and we're going to create our spending plan, but this seems really hard in terms of like, because, it, you know, quote unquote, unexpected, and you're going to talk more about that in a minute, but yeah. You're feeling like, I don't even know what this is going to be. What should I do? So give us an idea about this unexpected event fund. I, I definitely my, – my position on this, I would say it's been a very slight change. I still 100% uh, uh, feel that it is it is so crucial to build up an unexpected event fund, both personal and business. But when we're talking personal. We want to get started as – this is a quick goal you can make for yourself. If you don't, some so some people have money right now, but they're just it's just sort of not allocated. Like maybe they have a few hundred bucks here, a few hundred bucks here, they got some cash here. You could just boom make that your unexpected event fund. So unexpected events, the, the it's a quote on it's on it's in quotes because we can expect to have things come up that we're not ready for. With that said, uh, there's a lot of things that we. We know are coming. We just don't plan for. So what happens is when you set up your accounts the way that I recommended in the previous step, a lot of that goes away. So here's an example. Like a common one is a car is car trouble. What happens if I blow out all four tires and I got to pay I don't know a thousand bucks? Well, 
if I don't have anything set aside, then I'm going to be screwed because if I'm trying to pay down debt, now I might have to borrow more money uh, because I don't have that. I'm going to derail my savings plan. I'm derailing my financial goals. So this is uh, an account that you create that it allows you to start looking up a little bit. At first, when you're in all the mess that I was, you, you can't even look up because you're just in such a mess. But once you start, once you start developing this unexpected event fund, you can look up and you can see out a little bit, and that's how that works. So I recommend a thousand dollars is as fast as possible. It's a common recommendation by financial experts, and. The other piece to that is when you're doing those random accounts, a lot of it is less common because let's say you had a random account for car car problems or even for – like we have one for a future car. So theoretically, you're allowed to do what you want because it's your money. You know, if I have thousands of dollars sitting in an account for a future car and my tires blow out, I could use that money, right? There's nothing stopping that and that would make me uh, survive and I'd be able to keep moving forward. It would be a minor inconvenience rather than a huge derailment. So I think a combination of approaches can work. You know, trying to look out. I, I can't say that my daughter needing braces next year is an unexpected event or an emergency, right? Because the dentist told me her teeth are, <laughs> uh, are jammed up and she's going to need braces, right? So that would be foolish, right? It would be foolish for me one day to wake up and be like, oh, my, oh, oh no, I did not expect any of my three daughters to get married. Now I need some money to, uh, to help. You know, all these things, you know, we, can, we can look out and see what's going on and plan for them. So the, the real unexpected events – they're just things that are like above and beyond that, you know. Maybe like a uh, uh, something in your hat. Maybe you didn't have a random account for your oil burner, and the oil burner goes, and you gotta pay, uh, you know, a thousand dollars for it. Uh, so you want to get that thousand bucks as soon as possible, and then from there, you do want to build it further. Uh, I like three to six months. You'll hear uh, twelve months, which I think is a lot, especially when you have other financial goals, uh, depending on your 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 situation. So if you're the so like I'm a sole breadwinner in our house. But we also are in a strong financial position where there's not a lot, there's not as much risk. That we don't have uh, we don't have all this extra debt anymore, right? So it's like when you have all of that, then you might need more, right? Because you have so much you have to cover if something happens. So you got to think about what do I need if you know something something happened uh, devastating and I lost income for a few months? What would I do? That would usually not happen because usually. It would be more of a, of a, of a cutback. You know, there's not a ton of things that are going to happen that are going to cause you to like lose all of your income for a long period of time. You could have insurance in place to, to cover some of those things. Uh, but I think three to six months is a, is a good range depending on your situation and, and, and you know, married, unmarried, or, uh, and, and, and your just overall financial position. Yeah, I think with the pandemic, I agree with you. And also, if you're doing these other things, like if you create this spending plan and you understand where everything is, but then when you have something like the pandemic, yep. for some people who have all their eggs in one basket, that could be a huge problem. So it's probably, you know, for the people with all their eggs in one basket should think about probably a little longer period of time. But if you have some investments or if you have some different revenue yeah. streams, you probably don't need as many months. Yeah, here's a personal example. So I have a, a personal unexpected event fund, but I also have a business unexpected event fund. And in the business unexpected event fund, I'm a little conservative or a lot conservative. So I'm on payroll for the business. So I have my salary included in that. So mm -hmm. I said, you know what? If worse comes to worse and I have to dip into that, I can therefore be a little bit lighter here. So you just, again, you have to just look at the overall picture. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about what's really on a lot of young strength and conditioning and fitness professionals' minds, and that is destroying debt. I love this idea of the debt snowball because, you know, the young kids out there that, that did go to school for this, young strength coaches, if they did take a student loans, I know there was just some a certain amount of debt forgiveness uh, as of yesterday um, that's going to happen. But that's not the whole thing. So talk to us about destroying debt and your approach to it. Okay. So number one, you'll hear the terms thrown around like good debt and bad debt. Um, and another guy, a guy that I just recently started reading, this guy, Keith Cunningham, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a, he's a really smart uh, financial whiz. And he's like, he's like, you know, he's this super, you know, hundreds of businesses, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And he's like, man, all debt does is it limits your options. So you got to decide where you stand on that. But we're going to focus mostly on consumer debt 
you know, some people are leveraging themselves to try to build wealth and things like that. Um, but we can all agree that credit card debt, student loan debt, these are the kinds of debts that uh, you really want to attack uh, as fast as possible. You know why? Because your biggest uh, wealth building tool, which includes you building your future, uh, is your income. And if your income has to go towards paying down these debts, you're limited in what you can do. So it's 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 pretty uh, it's pretty much common sense, but we lose a lot of that uh, when we get into this, as I did. Uh, so there's different methods to, to, to paying down debts. You know, some of them there's there's a debt snowball. There's the avalanche method. Avalanche method. Uh, I do like the debt snowball uh, because of the reason that you said. I mean, there may be scenarios where uh, there could be slight adjustments, but I think this is one of those things where uh, people overthink it. It's like, what's the best uh, the best strength program or what's the best nutrition plan. And the reality is like, what's the answer, Anthony? It's like the one you're going to follow. Yeah, right. Sure. Uh, so it's, I think it's the same thing here. Like if you're going to order your debts and you attack them, um, the, 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 um, the debt snowball works really well because it, it, it includes that psychological, uh, benefit of those wins, those quick wins. Uh, so what you're doing on that is you're going to line up. You can do this right now uh, as long as you have access to your debt. You know whether, whether that's a credit card statement or your you know login for your student loans and whatever whatever else you have. You're just going to list them out. And what you're going to do, uh, which uh, you know, different than a lot of people are going to they're going to they're going to list it out and and pay them off in the order of the of the lowest interest rate. But if rather you're going to list them out in order of the lowest balance. Uh, and this, that, that, this snowball part is going to make sense in a second. Uh, so you're going to do that regardless of the interest that's due on it. I do recommend, just a side note, just include all the information. Yeah, even though you're doing that, you still want to put the interest rate. You still want to include the payoff and the, and the estimated time that it'll take. Uh, it's just good to have all that in front of you so you see where you're at. And then you can have a column, whether you're doing this pen and paper or with an app or the spreadsheet. Uh, I, I have a spreadsheet that I use with clients. And on that, you're going to put the minimums for all of those, all of those debts. And like generally what happens is most people who have a bunch of debt, they have some that are like really small. Like, Hey, I owe like this company $75. So yeah, you just pay that off in the first month. And now that $75 payment that had like a $10 minimum or $20 minimum you're just going to add that to the next item above it, uh, and that's where you get that snowball. And, and here's how powerful the snowball is. My last debt, uh, I started off as a sixty-four thousand dollar debt, uh, but by the time I got to the end, because it was the it was like the last one on the snowball, um, it was like thirty something thousand. And when I I had so many debts on my list. And think about all of those minimum payments, so hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. They kept mounting, and that snowball kept growing. By the end, I was making payments in the thousands because that's how much the debt snowball had built had built up to. Uh, so it's really, really powerful. I saw that it took me five years to pay off that debt. By the way, I know we didn't. I don't think we we mentioned that. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a really powerful method. And what I like about it is that it's it's pretty straightforward. It's not a lot of thinking. This is how you're going to do it, and then. We talked about before the, the 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 thing that you pay attention to is you know is what you're going to see more, and in addition to that, you're going to start getting more ideas because you're like, okay, I know how much my next my next debt is, so what else can I do to increase that snowball? What else can I do? Okay, maybe I could sell this uh, piece of equipment that I don't even use. Okay, what else can I do? Uh, maybe I could uh, I could get a side hustle. Or maybe I could start an online business, or maybe I could uh, pick up a few more hours and 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 put that towards it. That that's what happened to us. All those things and then some. I remember I had a guitar that I got when I was like 16 years old and like never really played, and I, it was sitting in my house and I put it on Craigslist. This guy came to my, came to my gym and gave me 25 bucks for it, and I just put that right towards my next debt. And it was 25 bucks. It was like you know it was like it might seem like nothing, but it was just the process of doing all that. Yeah, I think when you're checking boxes like that, like you talked about when you're, you know, you get rid of stuff and, and now you're just, you're kind of building momentum and, and getting more confident. So um, let's talk really quickly, because this could really be a whole, this is the, the investing piece. It's, it's, it's a lot. Just give us a general philosophy of like, when you feel like, hey, guys, you know, start it now. Or, you know, let's get these first steps done in like, let's get debt down a little bit before we start investing. Let's get the debt down. Where, where, where does this come in? 
Yeah, man, that's such an awesome question. And I have gone back and forth with this. I hate to take the cheesy answer, but it kind of depends. This is something I do with coaching clients is figure out what's the best plan for them. I, I will tell you what I did. I paid off every dollar of my debt other than my house before I started investing for the long term. And there's pros and cons to that. So the pro is that I was laser focused on the debt. And with my personality, that made sense because I'm a very like focused kind of person. I don't want to have multiple goals. I just want to chase one thing and get after it. And that's what I did. It took me five years. The downside is a lot of that was a really strong market and I lost five years of investing in, in, in compounding interest. Uh, so I, there have been times where I looked at that and I'm like, man, was that the right decision? At the end of the day, I'm, I'm happy with the decision I made because now I just have more that I can put towards it. Whereas if I still had the debt, I wouldn't have as much. Uh, so there are pros and cons. You have to weigh that out. I would say in ge to give a general statement, I like the idea of getting through the steps um, at least somewhat uh, before you start doing that. But there's a lot of factors. There's like your age. I was still pretty young, which which was part of my decision as well. If I'm uh, you know, 50 years old with no retirement and I'm starting this, I, I, I might look at that a little bit differently. So I, I think I think there's uh, there, there are different factors. Yeah. Uh, but when, so it's, uh, but when you get to that step, uh, you'll you'll want to start you know maximizing it as much as possible. I really I know we don't want to get too in the weeds, but just just take one one quick point. I really like the Roth IRA because uh, with a Roth IRA, uh, I, I can't remember if it's six thousand uh, you can put in. Uh, but you, uh, you, that money is paid after taxes. So you pay your taxes, then you invest it. But that money, especially for the young trains, I know you guys have a lot of young listeners, that will grow uh, theoretically forever because it can even be passed on. But it can, it can grow till retirement, uh, and and there and it grows tax free. Uh, so it's a big deal. So think about this: if you do uh, an investment like that, and let's say it grows to a million dollars, when you pull it out, you'll have guess how much. A million dollars, yeah. uh, but if you're doing another type uh, that's that's that doesn't give you that tax advantage, you may get a tax break now uh, because you're 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 getting a tax deduction. Uh, you're lowering your taxable income uh, that you're starting it with. Uh, it grows not tax free, and so then when you have that same million dollars, but you go and pull it out at retirement age, you, you know you may have you know three hundred thousand dollars less. That's a that's a lot. Uh, so. I'm a big fan of that, especially for young people. So I would look into – I'm okay with that, Anthony. You asked like when in the steps. If you guys want to start with a, start setting up a Roth and getting that funded at least somewhat, I'm, I'm not, I am not going to be upset about that because that is only going to serve you well. Uh, so that, that's just to, to answer that both of those questions. Yeah, I think you need to take your personality into account too. My wife makes a good amount of money, but like when we owned a house – we had a 30 year mortgage to start out with. Right. And yep. the, the rates were super low, but we went and refinanced when they went even lower and, and we got it like we had, we were like eight years in and we got it down to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Right. So we saved like seven years and then we refinanced again because the rates went down and we got it down to like 10 years. And it, like some people were saying, hey, you know, that's not really the smartest thing because if you take the 30 year, you know, you can make more money investing, but you have to take your personality into account. My wife hates debt. Like, oh, man. And she, and I, so she just said, no, I don't care about that. I'm good. And she saved for the future big time. But, you know, it was very much about like she, what she wanted, like what was what was more in her head made her feel comfortable. You know, listen, you never know what's going to happen. Not, not to, not to, I know we're trying to winding down here, not to take a turn to negative town. Uh, you know, but we just have a, we just had a client and the husband had a stroke and it's like, you just never know what life is going to throw at you. So yeah. I'm totally on the same page as your wife. I like the idea of not having a mortgage. I know the math. So if you're going to just look at math and you're looking at, you know, investing that over the years, yes, you may end up in a better position at the same time. It's how are you going to sleep best at night? How are you going to be happy? What is the money for? The money is for for you at some level to have enjoyment. And if that having a mortgage hanging over yourself is not something you want, then the other stuff doesn't matter. So I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. All right. Here's your one minute elevator pitch on uh, your courses, your books. How do people learn more from you or do some coaching with you? 
Awesome. Uh, well, I think the best way is uh, is just real simple. I love to just connect with fit pros, whether, and I mean this, I'm not just trying to say this to sound really nice. I just love connecting with people. So um, I would love to hear what's going on with you and see how I could help. We do a free 15 minute call. It's called a, it's called a Q and a, you just tell me what you have going on and I can kind of direct you from there, whether that's private coaching, whether that's one of the virtual cor courses or workshops from there, we're going to help you regardless of which is the best option. We're going to help you get clarity over your finances. We're going to help you make decisions that you're confident about. We're going to help you do some of the things we talked about, perhaps like paying down debt, saving for the future, and just being uh, in control and having clarity with, uh, with your finances. Love it. And I can attest to that because before we even did a podcast, before I you sent me the book, you we got on a Zoom call just to chat and get to know each other. So uh, very cool. I, Billy, I really appreciate you coming on and giving uh, young fit pros and older fit pros uh, really some great steps to kind of uh, understand that you are in control of this stuff. Uh, great job. We really appreciate you coming on. Awesome, Anthony. I know I already did my pitch, but also just stay connected. You, they can check out the podcast. Uh, lots of free information out there as well. All right, that's going to do for episode 341 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try the new strengthcoach.com out for seven days for free. Totally new format. User-friendly, the same great forum as always. It's the place where top coaches in the industry Come to connect and learn to access that offer. Go to strengthcoach.com. Special thanks to Chris Parter and the folks over at Perform Better. The huge summer sale is going on right now. 40% off a ton of items, including TRX, suspension trainers, ultimate sandbags, all kinds of cleaning supplies, Rolga rollers, plow boxes, and more. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Billy Halfacker for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning, performance enhancement, and fitness profits. Thanks to Nomly helping build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. Go to nomly.com and use the referral code strength coach to get started on a free 30 day trial. Thanks to Vince Gabriel and Kiz Marketing. If you need some help with your marketing, head over to kizmarketing.net to book a free coaching call with Will Matheson, Vince Gabriel's secret marketing weapon. Thanks to Nico Willette and Perch. Perch is a 3D camera based weight room technology solution bringing VBT into the 21st century. Head over to perch.fit slash strength coach to find out more about it. They have some great videos showing the cameras and how to use it. Thanks to Athletic Greens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash strength coach to get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Also a reminder about Inside Tracker. I use it to look under the hood. Definitely helps me to stay ahead of my health. Checking out 43 biomarkers. You can get 20% off with the code RENA Pro 20. My name's Anthony Renner. Check out the show notes at continuefit.com or strengthcoachpodcast.com. Guys, thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.